welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm going back to the dawn of the SUV. All those years back, 30-ish years, or 25 kind of, to the, one of the first, the primeval, the pioneers. Yeah, this is a Honda CRV. And it's got a weird waggly column shift thing on it as well. How strange. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rutum in Kent, so do please check out their stock list in the description below. Now on with the review after this quick word from our sponsor. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're going back to the 1990s when SUVs were interesting and different rather than a byword for boring. Back in what I'm going to call the greatest decade. Every manufacturer was jumping on that new bandwagon of that sport utility vehicle, often based on one of their current existing models. Obvious examples would be things like the Freelander, the RAV4 and the Ford Maverick. But this is Honda's offering, the CRV or the comfy recreational vehicle, apparently. Believe it or not, this is now into its sixth generation, but this car here is the first gen, which appeared in 1995. It was Honda's first in-house designed SUV, and it was styled by Hiroyuki Kawazi starting in 1993. It finally went on sale in 1995. In October of that year, it went on sale in Japan only, Primo and Werner dealerships, before hitting Europe and the US in 1996. Now let's take a bit of a look around the thing. Now underpinning this is a Honda Civic, believe it or not, although because this was the early days of SUVs when they're still doing things properly as soft rotors, it is actually all wheel drive. And although it doesn't really share anything in terms of panel work with the Civic, the styling is very much Honda. There are certain visual cues, the slightly curved slap sides and low scuttle mean it can be nothing else. Another very Honda thing is the retractable aerial which retracts into the driver's A-post. Now this is a low mileage one owner car, so we think everything on here is dealer fit. For example, this big solid metal boulevard, not particularly pedestrian friendly, but back in the 90s, these things were allowed and popular, so dealer fit option. And I believe the bumpers and side trim normally is bare plastic, but this I think has been painted by the dealer as well. I stand to be corrected on this. Another dealer fit option, the spare wheel cover. And of course the spare wheel itself being on the boot is another throwback reference to the fact that these were kind of semi-copying four-wheel drive proper off-roaders at this time still. Whereas today they're just jacked up hatchbacks. Back then they were trying to be sort of a stepping stone between an off-roader and a regular car. Right, let's take a look inside the car, but first of all take a look at these door handles, which are quite interesting the way that the handle itself pulls clear of its surround and you pull the door open with it like that. Interesting. Stepping over a large plastic door sill with a metal tread plate with CRV embossed in it. Don't forget that you forget what you're getting into. Let's take a quick look at the door card itself. It does have a certain Hondery Japanesey look in terms of the materials, but because this is fairly posh, I think initially there was only an LX trim and they expanded that range as things went on. By 1997, I think there's a couple more options. This has got a leather, or at least a leatherette, perforated padded area at the top and matching. I think plastic material which looks and feels very similar but obviously hard rather than flexible. The big door pull which goes all the way like a big hockey stick down the side of the door. Plastic door handle, little nubbin to lock and unlock. And interestingly we've got a boot release button hidden halfway down the door card. Quite curious. And more curious still, big flat area here, then a small tiny cubby area for putting sweets and things, a larger cubby area for well, bigger sweets, and then your pocket, which is quite shallow, but you have a, a higher level barrier. I don't know, so you can put tall maps or something in there, I imagine, they won't fall over. A little bit unusual. Anywho, let's climb in and look at the interior. Wow, this fabric is something else. A zigzag of joy, it's a heavy, this is Twelour again. They, there was a love of Twelour back in the 90s, I guess, which is basically velour with the texture of tweed. It is incredible, and I am massively impressed. There's actually, I think, five colors in here. You've got the light gray, the dark gray, you've got purple, you've got green, and I think there's a mid fleck as well of, of a mid gray. Minimum four, possibly five shades 
in what is otherwise a fairly simple fabric. And also we've got the, the look through type headrest. So you, this is a safety thing borrowed from Volvo. You can look through there, see behind you more easily. And much adjustment is available. Let's climb in, climb up and in because oh, it's SUV, so our command seating position and we have much of interest to take our fancy. On the right hand side, we've got our window switches here on the dashboard. Now you may remember when we did the FRV, the six seater Honda a little while ago, I noted that the uh, window switches were here on the dashboard as well, which I assumed was to make the door cards narrower and more space inside the car. And I think they've done a similar trick here because there is absolutely acres of space between the driver and passenger seat here in the front. So those are our electric window switches here on the dashboard. Um, very grey, very plastic, which is very much of the time and of the manufacturer. Air vent, which has got an integrated mirror switch. I've not seen that done previously. And up here another air vent with an integrated fog light switch. A just slightly random placement of buttons here. Very odd. This looks a lot like the Rover R8 switch gear, actually. I have to say, in fact, very much like the Rover R8 switch gear, which was, of course, obviously shared with the rovers at the time. In fact, looking at the indicators and the wiper stalks, those those are well, they're not so basically the same. They are the same. These are the same switch gear and wiper stalks you find in a Rover R8. Uh, Rover was trying to transition away from those things at the time because they were having to pay a license fee on all of them. Now we have a panel of three potential switches. One being roof main or main roof which is a really odd switch because it doesn't actually control the sunroof per se. All it does is turn on and off the switch for the moonroof, a full, well, not full length, about a third of the roof going backwards is a big glass panel. So now I can operate it, push that button. Oh no, the roof is broken. So if you want to get a few quid off the price of one of these things when you're haggling, just hit that button and then deactivate the roof. Okay, so we've mentioned the stalks, let's talk about the instruments. That's a fairly tidy cluster. Tachometer, speedometer, a couple of gauges here in the, on the right hand side for fuel and temperature, but check out this light stack for the Prindle, park reverse neutral, D4, D3, two and one, so you can lock it in any of the four speeds. This is an automatic, there's a five speed manual available, but this though is a column shift on the left. I'm amazed you can actually do that with the ignition turned off. But someone has fitted, or say someone, the previous owner has fitted a metal Momo shift lever on there, which is a bit, a bit flash and fun. I'll show you through that in a moment. Steering wheel, fairly slim rimmed actually, hard plastic, not much padding, but a texture here, so it looks like perforated leather, but it's the same stuff as on the door, which is like a rubberized stuff. Airbag, of course, being 1997, and horn, twin horn buttons. Ooh excitedly parpy. Steering wheel is adjustable for height but not for rake. Over to the left we have got big air vents, tiny tiny digital clock and rather incongruously a big bright red hazard light switch which weirdly is quite dirty so someone has been stopping at the side of the road and flashing quite a lot. How curious. Above that we do have an extraordinarily good central T-shelf area. Honda were clearly learning from their, their friends at Rover at the time because this T-shelf is exemplary. We also have passenger airbag built into the top. Don't put your cup of tea on there while driving because if that goes off, you'll be wearing your China wear. The dashboard below that is fairly slab-like. Air vent for the window, air vent for the person over on the left. The glove box, which is actually a good deep size underneath that. And then coming back to the center, we've got a little black panel here, which is rather sparse, it has to be said. An aftermarket JVC head unit living in the middle. Two panels of nothingness. So perhaps if this had air conditioning, that might be just there. A weirdly placed headlamp leveling switch. That's never normally in the center where the air conditioning and ventilation goes. This looks like you should be able to pull it, but you can't. And then we just have three dials for what little heating and ventilation we have plus recirculation and heated rear window. And finally below that, we have of course got the lighter and sweetie tray wrapper, but below that we've got hidden in the bottom of this binnacle, a huge storage bucket. I reckon you would get six or seven McDonald's large fries in the bottom of that. Huge space, it's waterproof as well. So if you wanted to have some kind of drink with long straws going on, you could load that in there as well. Very handy. 
as I said before, there is a mass of space between the driver and passenger. You could put a dog kennel down there. If you're travelling with animals, this would be amazing. And you can kind of see how they maybe got the idea for the FRV because they thought, well, there's room for another chair in there. What they did put down there was a proper mechanical manual handbrake, twin cup holders, and a huge picnic area. So you can actually, whoops, flip that away. There is a lever underneath it that spring loads it down and then pops it back up again. So if you have reason to need something large and long in the, whoops, in the center of that, whoops, you can make it go away. And it's quite hard to make it go back again, one-handedly. Headroom is impressive. It's a very tall, boxy car, so you've got a ton of headroom because of the very thin doors. You've got lots of elbow room as well, so all good. Let's take a look in the back quickly. Again, the curious pull door handles. Lots and lots of paperwork with this car, and it's just past its MOT as well, so lots of stuff. Ow. Now, looking in the back, we have got a fairly flat floor. Big step over the sill, then you climb in and you're way, way up. It feels like you're sitting much higher in the back than you were in the front, so you're a bit closer to the, the roof, especially with the sunroof mechanism, which comes down quite a way out of the ceiling. Not a bad view from the back here. Very comfortable, the seats are very firm. We have two individual armrests, which is an unusual feature. Don't often see that. And looking at how these seats are stacked at the moment, it looks like we've got variable position reclination for the seat back. So if you've got big square boxes you need to be carrying in the back, it means your seat passengers in the rear can sit a bit more vertically and you can get a bigger square item into the boot. That's astonishingly practical. Also, these seats do lift up from the base and fold all the way forward if you want so you can have a completely flat load area. It's incredibly practical. This is the days when SUVs were actually really useful cars rather than fashion statements. Okay, now this is interesting around the back. First of all, we've got our original dealer sticker from Eddie Grimstead in uh, Romford. Up to the left-hand side, we've got a warning notice in four languages. To prevent damage to the glass, close the tailgate before the hatch glass. That, I think, is quite an important note of safety. You notice we do have a small wiper, quite a significant triangle of doom, I think, will be happening just there. Lift that tail glass up, and it is frameless tail glass, worth the mentioning. So you can access, like on a BMW 3 and 5 series, the back of your boot area without having to open the full tailgate. Once that's open, you can then open the barn door sided tailgate bottom. And now you see why you need to be shutting that first because these chunky bits will shatter that glass if you swing that wrong. It would be a bad thing. Interesting to note we've got a cutout in the bumper for the uh, rear slung spare wheel hanging there off the back of the, uh, the boot. We've got a fabric load space cover, which is an unusual accessory to see. And it has got hoops around the headrests to keep it in place. And it's separated in the center, bifurcated, I believe the phrase is, or word is, um, so that the two halves of the seats can be moved independently to a certain extent. And it's held in with poppers. This car is curiosity after curiosity. Wow. And once we've moved that floppy lid, we've got a fairly sizable boot. Big speakers here in the sides, plus we have a power outlet on one side and a curry hook for hanging your takeaway up there on the left. Sizable storage compartment on the right. Anything under the floor? Well, yes, we have. We have much to be excited about under the floor. We've got a Honda CRV branded picnic table and space for us second spare wheels. If you need to overland this thing, you can have lunch and have two flat tires. Oh, that's where the jack lives underneath that. Let's take this out and put it up. So there we have the boot floor tea shelf, an original accessory, standard I believe on all of these things. So humongously practical. You turn up with the family in your practical family vehicle, you need to stop for a snack and a sandwich, no problem. Pop out the floor, you've got somewhere to sit and have your snacks. If you're a market trader or a YouTuber who's selling merchandise at a car show, again, brilliant. It's all just there waiting for you in the boot. And over to the left and right, we have little wooden panels covering wheel nuts, I guess for locking wheel nuts on one side, and tools on the other. 
isn't that fun? Now under the bonnet we've got the Honda B20B2 litre four cylinder petrol. There's not a lot to say, it's powerful enough and it's quite smooth and being a Honda just change the oil once every couple of years and it will never break. It's fuel injected with a mechanical throttle cable still rather than drive by electronic wire rather than physical wire. Quite a bit of space in here though so if you did want to up the ante with the engine with a swap to a V6 or something chances are it would fit relatively easily. Right so I've forgotten my regular camera mount so I'm going to make do with positioning a tripod in the rear and I'm hoping it doesn't fall over. Now we pull the selector towards us, drop it down to D, D4 in that case and away we go. Two litre, 126 horsepower, drifts away very comfortably. There's a five speed manual option. Uh, this one does though obviously have the four speed auto. It does sound very Honda-y. That nice light buzzing sound of the engine is quite calming and relaxing. It doesn't entice you to drive rapidly. And there's an awful lot of body roll. But then it's a very tall vehicle and it, with all-wheel drive as well, it was designed to be a go-anywhere, do-anything, a comfortable recreational vehicle. Literally what it says on the bootlid. Everything about the car is light and easy. It's very typically Honda in that respect. So the steering, obviously be hydraulic in the 1990s. It's nice and light and it's got a good direct feel. Right, truck's out the way. Let's hoof it down the road. 0 to 60 was 10 and a half seconds on this thing. And the top speed is 108 miles an hour. For a big thing shaped like a brick, that's not bad going. It does feel very Honda-like, the, the big windscreens, so even though it's a tall car, they've still got a fairly low scuttle in relation to the way you sit. So it's coming in sort of bottom of my chest height carries on above my eye line so it feels very very light and open in here. As a, that is really pretty much a Honda attribute certainly of this era. As I say it's quite rolly, quite softly sprung but it does have independent suspension all round. It's double wishbones at the front which is very much a Honda favourite. They had to be talked out of it when they were doing the, uh, the Rover collaborations because Honda were desperate to use the double wishbones. Rover just wanted to simplify it with McPherson struts. They got their way in the end, which gave better car handling. At the back, it's multi-link trailing arms. So it does grip the road well, but it does roll equally a large amount. So throughout the, the 1990s, these things became just insanely popular because there just hadn't been anything like it before. If you wanted a, a comfortable car, a regular family car, you had to buy a hatchback or a saloon or an estate. If you wanted an off-roader, then you were buying something that was crude and lumpy and, well, it wasn't very nice to be in, to be honest, most of the time. Then suddenly these things appeared, which gave you, well, the best of both worlds. And even though I do now really hate SUVs with something of a passion, these original ones are just so wildly different. A comfortable car with the ability to go almost anywhere. Okay, not as anywhere as a full-on tricked-out Defender 90 with all the off-roady bits on it, but it'll get you into places that a regular car won't. Whereas today, they are basically just a regular hatchback on jacked up suspension, fancy bodywork, and nine times out of 10, actually less practical interior space than the hatchback it was based on at the expense of MPG and handling. So yeah, they, they're no longer a winning formula. These things though were interesting and different. And I think there's probably a little bit of nostalgia for them now. Now, of course, these things were built all around the world, not only in Japan, where they originated, and the ones for Europe and the UK actually were built here in Swindon. So this is a British car that I'm driving, which makes it even more of a rival to the Freelander than you might first expect. 
Now the question is, if I had to choose between one 90s soft roader, would I take this or my Freelander? Well, difficult question. I think this is definitely the better car. It's probably better thought out. Um, it's definitely better made. It's just generally the tougher and more likely to not break example of the two vehicles. However, character does come from flaws and the more overtly off-roadiness of the Freelander does make it just a bit more fun in a silly sort of way. And I'm fully aware that this is probably equally as capable off-road as the baby Land Rover. But you know, I like the quirkiness of the Land Rover, especially with the very early multicolored dashboards, which just look really interesting and fun. Once you're at the wheel, you do get to enjoy that command driving position. You do feel you're sat up an awful lot higher than in a regular car, certainly a lot more than in the Civic. The trade-off, of course, is the handling is far more wobbly and wafty than the Civics would be. And of course, the MPG isn't quite as good. I think this gets a combined average of around 27, whereas the Civic will be up in the mid to high 30s. Well, the visibility out of this thing is really incredible. I've mentioned the big um, windscreen already. The side windows are also equally massive and the B posts are set well back so you've got a great view over your shoulder and those mirrors are absolutely huge. The Hondas do tend to wear pretty well as a rule anyway, but this one has only got what, under 14,000 miles, 13,795 miles on the clock and it's one owner from you. This really is an example of one of those barely run-in cars. And this is a 1997 example. This is 25 years old and the interior looks brand new. It's quite incredible. It's quite interesting as you, if you look back through the, the various generations, how the CRV has evolved just so massively from the original very well, very 90s, flat-sided, big headlights to the current one which is just nothing but curves and creases and squinty lights and all the rest of it. Well thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this well touch of 90s nostalgia and the start of something which was once good and pure and has now become corrupt. Yes, SUVs. If you've enjoyed please as always hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.